So welcome. This is the um, Fulbright um, information session on um, finding your Fulbright host affiliation, tips and tricks on getting started. Uh, just a couple of uh, reminders uh, as, uh, as we get started. Uh, before we do, uh, please uh, mute your mic. Um, and if you like, you can also mute your video. Um, as I said before, this uh, session is being recorded and the recording will be available on our Canvas site. Um, if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A window and we'll try to answer them um, at the end. And as I said, the recording and the slides will be posted on our uh, Canvas site and I'll come back at the end and talk a little bit more about our, our Canvas site. So um, just to get uh, get going on uh, about a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Azumi Antakara. I go by my middle name, Anne. I am one of the uh, II Fellowships and Grant Advisors. And um, in my portfolio um, are the Fulbright U.S. Student Program, which is the program that we're talking about today. Um, also the Fulbright Hayes uh, DDRA or the Total Dissertation Research Abroad Fellowship Program and uh, the Fulbright Scholars Program, which is for postdocs, uh, faculty and staff. Um, academically, I am a sociologist uh, by academic background. Um, no longer active practicing uh, research uh, in terms of research or teaching, but that's where my background is. Um, in terms of the world region, my background is in East Asian studies, specifically Japanese studies. Um, and um, so uh, that's kind of where I come from in terms of um, the, uh, my specializations. I am a Fulbright alumna. I was a recipient of the Fulbright Hayes uh, the full Dissertation Research Abroad Fellowship when I was a PhD student, and I spent 12 months in Japan uh, conducting my um, my dissertation research on um, on the on the Fulbright Hayes DDRA program. All right, so um, that's a little, that's a little bit uh, about me. We have a team of advisors for Fulbright, so I am one of the one of four um, that's doing advising on Fulbright. And um, my um, primarily, I work with students who are working on a independent research proposals um, on in the study research option, and um, especially with graduate students. Um, in terms of the agenda today. Um, so at uh, first, a brief overview about the Fulbright U.S. Student Program, and then the, really the question of uh, this afternoon, the central question for this afternoon, do I need a host affiliation for my Fulbright application? And if I do, what are the strategies um, to go about finding one and what resources are available to help you do that? So let's jump right in um, to an overview of the Fulbright U.S. Student um, Program. Um, in terms of eligibility, um, this is open to graduating seniors, recent graduates, graduate students, as well as early career professionals, including creative and performing arts artists and musicians. Basic eligibility requirement: you need to have U.S. citizenship by the time uh, by the application deadline. Um, you need to have your bachelor's degree in hand. Um, or the, uh, the equivalent of a bachelor's degree by the start of the grant. So you can still be applying without a degree, but by the time you start your grant and you're actually receiving Fulbright money and doing Fulbright activities, you will need to have your bachelor's degree in hand. Um, also, no doctorate at the time of the application. That's kind of the other end of this. This is a U.S. student program, and so the understanding is that you're still a student or relatively early in your career. And so um, uh, if you have a doctorate, or if you're going to be getting a doctorate, um, then um, if you have a doctorate in hand by the time of the application, then you will be uh, applying under, a, you should be applying under a different program. Um, in addition to these basic eligibility requirements, there are some country specific um, eligibility requirements and all of those are explained on the, um, the National Fulbright website um, under the e each individual country and the award. And so you should go and, and make sure that you check on those um, before um, you, you select your award and start applying. Um, in terms of award types, um, the Fulbright U.S. Student Program Awards come in two um, basic um, two basic types, the Study Research Grant and the English Teaching Assistantships. Uh, there are approximately uh, 2,150 uh, or so awards uh, going to 140 countries. Um, 
and uh, about 900 awards for the independent research study or arts projects um, in approximately pretty much all of the countries um, that uh, that the Fulbright is associated in, and then ETAs or English teaching assistantships, um, a few more awards, 1,250 or so, uh, and in about 75 countries or uh, thereabouts. Study and research grants further subdivide into uh, graduate study, um, independent research, and uh, performing and creative arts project. And we'll come back and talk a little bit more about that um, a little bit later. Um, in terms of application component, um, there's an online application um, where you will be asked um, to fill out um, some forms and uh, write some short answer, um, short answer um, uh, questions, a couple of paragraphs in most cases. Um, two essays, one's called a statement of grand purpose, the other one's called a personal statement. Um, depending on which type of Fulbright you are applying to, study and research, two pages, ETA applications, one page max. Uh, the statement of grand purpose is basically what is the essay that ex uh, that in which you will explain uh, what you're going to do uh, during your Fulbright grant uh, period. And then personal statement is, um, like, just as the name suggests, uh, uh, an essay about you, who you are, where you come from, um, a kind of a, a narrative autobiography of who you are and what you represent. And then reports and references, um, foreign language evaluation, if it's required, three um, letters of reference, and then transcripts, and then um, other materials uh, for research and study applicants, affiliation letters uh, for uh, performing and creative about applicant, applicant uh, supplementary materials, essentially your um, uh, your arts portfolio, um, those are also um, also required. Um, award benefits, um, you can see um, there are pre, um, if you are awarded a Fulbright Fellowship, you get run to airfare, a monthly stipend, um, basically a monthly amount um, that's enough to cover your living expenses, not luxurious, but should be enough to pay for your rent, food, and um, basic living needs, um, coverage for your accident and sickness um, insurance uh, for um, ETA applicants, um, an online uh, teaching English to speakers of other languages fundamentals course, and then depending on the country and the award, um, other possible uh, benefits include uh, support for, uh, for dependents, research allowance, could possibly tuition for uh, graduate courses, language lessons, and um, uh, disability-related accommodations and um, other kinds of activities as well. Um, there are also some um, Post-grant um, benefits that come basically as being an alumnus of uh, or alumna of the Fulbright program, um, including um, eligibility for 12 months of uh, uh, non-competitive eligibility hiring status for the federal government jobs. In other words, you get kind of um, a priority um, hiring for uh, federal government positions. Um, in terms of the application deadline, uh, the online application opened earlier this month on, on April 2nd, and so we're right in the early application period, and this is the time for you to uh, design your project and prepare your application. The campus deadline is August 25th. Um, that is, uh, it's the Sunday before the first day of classes. It is an online deadline, so we're able to have a Sunday deadline, and it is an online deadline. Uh, the national application deadline is October um, 8th. Uh, that's a Tuesday, 5 p.m. Eastern time. That is, is a absolutely no-nonsense hard deadline um, where um, they will give you absolutely no exceptions for uh, missing this deadline. So this is a hard deadline. Um, and then once the national deadline passes, your application will go through two stages of reviews. The first stage takes place within the United States called the National Screening Committees. If you uh, come out of this first stage of a review, um, and you're successful, then you will find out uh, typically in um, sometime in January whether you made it for made it past the first cut or not. And if you make the first cuts, you're designated as a semifinalist. And then as semifinalist, your application will then go over to the host country. And then the host country, either the Fulbright Commission um, and the U.S. Embassy will conduct the final review and make the final decisions. Um, the final decisions will start coming out um, as early as sometime in uh, mid-March. And um, 
notifications oh, they oh, will keep coming uh, as late can go as late as June, although the vast majority of decisions will come out by the end of April. I think uh, right now uh, for us, um, I would say we would have we heard from about I think well over ninety percent of the applicants have been notified at this time. Yeah, but there's a a little bit more uh, more to go. Um, final status. Um, you basically comes in one of three types. Either you're a finalist, you're being selected for the award and you're designated as a finalist. You're an alternate and and um, there's a possibility of being upgraded to a finalist later on, um, depending on what happens with the first round of offers to the finalists. Or um, the third uh, possible outcome is that you're not selected for the award. Um, so those would be um, the, uh, the possible outcomes of the uh, second round of reviews. Um, if you are selected for the award, then you will prepare to leave over the summer, and then um, in most cases, you will depart for your Fulbright experience in late summer, uh, typically toward the end of August at the earliest, um, generally sometime in September. Okay. So then the, um, the question is, do I need a host institution or an affiliation for my Fulbright application? That is really the meat of what we're going to talk about um, in this session. And um, as is often the case with a lot of Fulbright, um, the Fulbright application to the Fulbright experience, it depends is the answer, uh, kind of the very general high level answer to that question. And so let's look at that a little bit um, more um, in depth and uh, kind of tease out what, what are the situations where you need, an, you need a, um, an, a host institution and which ones that you don't. Um, First, the English teaching assistantships. Um, this is the easy one. Uh, successful ETA candidates will receive a placement. Uh, the placement will be determined by the, uh, the host country, either the Fulbright Commission or the US Embassy in the host country. And um, so um, this is going to be a placement. Um, you will not be uh, responsible for um, finding a host institution uh, the Fulbright Commission or the U.S. Embassy will find a host institution for you and will place you at an institution. And so there's no host affiliation required at the time of the application. And so no affiliation letter would be required. So this is the easy one. If you are doing one of the, um, the study research um, options, um, you can subdivide the, that and look at specific situations within study research. So first, if you're uh, if you'd like to do a graduate degree program um, in your as a study research option, if you're going to be doing a graduate degree, whether as a partnership award or as a, as an open research uh, study research proposal, your graduate degree institution is going to be your host institution. Uh, so if you're going to be doing a graduate degree, then your graduate degree institution is going to be your host institution. And officially, your graduate admission letter is going to be your official host affiliation letter. Now, in most cases, you will not have this letter at the time of the Fulbright application, and that's OK. Um, there will be opportunities later on to submit that letter. So um, unless you've, um, you've been admitted and you've deferred your admission because you're still looking for funding to be able to go to a graduate degree program, um, you will not have your admission letter at the time of the full, at the time that you're applying for, for the full right, and that's okay. Um, in most cases, you will be doing two applications if you're doing the graduate degree option. You're going to be doing the graduate degree admission application on the timetable of the graduate degree admission, and then you're also going to be doing a Fulbright application on the Fulbright schedule. And typically, the Fulbright schedule will run way ahead of the graduate admission schedule. And so you're going to be doing your Fulbright application first, and then um, you're going to be doing your uh, graduate degree admission application, uh, maybe after your Fulbright um, application. Now, there are some exceptions to this, and this is beginning to be beginning to happen. Uh, the, the, there are small cases where uh, there are some partnership awards where a specific Fulbright award is tied to either a specific master's degree program or a specific university where you will use your Fulbright application also for the graduate um, degree admission. And 
if this is the case, it will this will be specified in the award description, and so you should read the award description carefully to determine whether you're going to be required to do two separate applications, the full right admission and the graduate admission application, or, or whether you're only going to be doing the full right application, and they're going to use that to do also graduate admission as well. So this is something that's relatively new that's coming, um, but, uh, but this is something that you really should pay attention to um, as you're going through the, um, the word description. Um, so as I mentioned before, the official admission letter is not required by the application deadline, um, but the official admission letter will be required later in the process and definitely before um, they can finalize the award um, after your finalist notification. Um, if you selected to receive the award, then at that point, um, you will be asked to submit the official admission letter uh, to the graduate program to finalize your award and to say, yes, you're set to go. Um, you're set to go enroll in the graduate program and that you have the full right funding to go and do your graduate program. Okay. Um, now, I will also mention that uh, even if it's not required, an affiliation letter may be helpful in your application. Um, the requirements depend on the award. Some um, some awards will actually say that you should get an affiliation letter or a letter from um, a faculty member um, at the, that teaches in the graduate degree program um, as a letter of support. Um, so um, again, read the description, uh, the award description, to see if. Um, see if this is required. Um, even if it's not required, um, a lot of times it's helpful to have this letter. And if you can get this letter, usually it, it, it is a plus on your application um, to include such a letter even when it's not required. Okay, so that's graduate the, the graduate degree option. Uh, the gist of it is that your official um, degree admission letter is your official letter of affiliation. In most cases, you won't have it at the time of the Fulbright deadline, application deadline, but at, at some time later in the uh, later in the process, you will be uh, required uh, to provide that letter to finalize your award. Okay. Um, independent research. Um, if you're going to be doing independent research, at least one host institution is required. Um, you may have more than one uh, one host affiliation, and typically you can uh, you can have up to three. Um, and you must secure your own affiliation, and most countries require at least one letter by the national deadline. Um, again, things vary, uh, the requirements vary, and they are spelled out in the, uh, in the individual um, uh, country award description, um, and you will see um, that um, uh, what the requirements are for each country. Um, all right. Um, and then finally, if you're doing a creative and performing arts project, and by that we mean usually studying an artistic skill or technique, um, a host affiliation or host or uh, host in this case could be an organized program like a, um, a conservatory or an institute, or it could also be an individual artist or an instructor who could teach you a particular artistic skill or technique. Um, so that person is going to be your primary host. And you may also, in addition to that, uh, want an academic host institution um, in addition to that uh, person who's going to teach you that artistic skill uh, and, the, the, and the person that you're going to start the study with uh, for that skill. Again, you may have more than one affiliation and you can have up to three. And again, you must secure your own affiliation. And um, again, most countries require at least one letter of affiliation by the uh, national deadline. Okay, so exactly what are the affiliation requirements? Again, it depends. Uh, requirements do vary by country, um, but they are specified uh, for each award in the award description. Um, and you will find the country and the award specific requirements in the affiliation section of that award description. And we'll come back in a minute and look at a couple of examples. Uh, generally speaking, um, accredited public or state universities and colleges are acceptable for all awards. Uh, in addition, private universities and colleges are also acceptable for most awards, although there are some countries that say only public institutions um, are acceptable. Um, so again, I'll read the description. Um, 
In addition to universities and colleges and other institutions of post-secondary education, um, government laboratories, research institutes, museums, archives, those, are, those kinds of organizations are possible in many countries. Um, again, the, the, if these are, um, uh, these are acceptable, that will be specified in the, um, in the award description. And finally, private think tanks, non-governmental organizations or NGOs, international organizations like um, a, a United Nations or a World Bank office. Um, not always acceptable as a primary affiliation, but um, they but these kinds of organizations may be okay as a secondary affiliation. Um, so if you're thinking about doing projects that often are involved um, NGOs, um, like projects that have to do with human rights, um, uh, you may um, need to figure out a way to get a uh, a, a either a university or a government office affiliation that's uh, that meets the criteria of the of the award, and then have that NGO um, as a, a or an international organization as a secondary affiliation. As I as I mentioned before, you can ha you can have more than one affiliation, so this might be something where you need to think creatively about um, how to organize that. So let's go and look at a couple of examples. The first one we have is India. And this is an, an excerpt of the affiliation section of the uh, Open Study Research page um, for India. And so it says, independent study research letter recommended but not required uh, at deadline. So that's number one, letter recommended but not required at deadline. So um, when it says recommended but not required, um, it's always a plus if you can get a letter, but if you can't get an official letter of affiliation, um, it's not required. So, uh, so it's not gonna count against you um, if you don't have it, but it's a plus if you can get one. Um, location, the details, some uh, specifics about where um, within India um, you're, you're allowed to go. There are restricted areas uh, and, and part, part of this I think has to do with um, uh, with uh, health and safety um, a, a, a safety uh, physical safety uh, related uh, related issues and so there are um, so again restrictions on where you can go um, and the India page continues and so this is the um, the uh, the second half of the uh, description for India. Um, so, um, so here we, uh, we see that according to the government and their regulations, Fulbrighters must be affiliated either with institutions or organizations of higher education approved and listed on the website of the Indian Ministry of Education, including institutions accredited by uh, AICTE, UGE, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so here is a um, here are the requirements for India, uh, as far as what kinds of institutions and um, organizations are acceptable. Um, and then here's a link uh, to the um, uh, to the uh, to the list uh, in, at the Ministry of Education um, that will give you a link to all of the um, the institutions uh, that are accredited. Um, and again, finally, in the last paragraph, it says applicants are encouraged to indicate their affiliation preferences and secure an invitation letter from an institution when possible. So uh, they would like to see a letter of invitation, but um, they also realize that that may not always be possible. And um, so it's um, so as I, I as we saw before, it's letter recommended but not required at deadline. Okay. So um, let's go look at another example. Uh, second example, South Africa. Uh, this one um, in the affiliation, at the top of the affiliation section, we see a letter required for independent study or research and deadline. And it says for the applicants must identify and initiate contact with an educational institution, research facility, or other appropriate institution for their projects. They're required to include affiliation letters or research clearance letters with their applications. Affiliation is possible at any of the 26 universities or technical universities in the new higher education structure in South Africa. And then 
below this paragraph, there is actually actual list of the 26 institutions that are possible um, organized uh, by uh, organized by region. Um, I didn't. Um, I didn't copy all of that, so we're going to skip all of that. Um, but but uh, this actually is at um, this country page is actually quite helpful in that it just gives you a complete list of all of the uh, the possible um, institutions that are available for affiliation. Um, and then there is a little um, little note about why, uh, about the campuses, and then finally. Um, in the last paragraph, it says um, affiliation with other public or private institutions will also be considered. Applicants are encouraged to contact the U.S. Embassy's full right office if they have general questions. Um, the embassy is unable to provide assistance with affiliations. So, um, so basically what they're saying is you're on your own as far as um, finding an affiliation. Um, if you have general questions, they are willing to answer them, but they're not going to help you actually pick or find an affiliation that you're, um, that as an applicant, you need to do that on your own without relying on the embassy. Okay. So now that we know kind of what, uh, what the required general requirements are um, and when we need um, an affiliation, you just kind of go, um, uh, let's think about what to look for in a host institution. Obviously, you need one that meets your uh, country and award specific requirements. So we saw, as we see, saw in the India and South Africa examples, um, there are specific requirements um, for that's country specific and um, award specific. And so you do need to make sure that uh, whatever uh, host institution you're going to end up choosing, that the that that institution meets those requirements. Ideally, you want at least one research scholar who can act as your research mentor for the year. Um, that could be a professor, a lecturer, a research scientist, somebody who teaches, who has a teaching appointment. Um, could also be somebody who has a research appointment and doesn't teach. Um, that really depends on the nature of the university and the institution and how they're organized in each country. Um, so, you know, many countries are like the United States where professors are expected to both teach and conduct research. There are other countries where um, professors primarily teach, um, where there, there are, there's a very um, a distinct separation between teaching faculty and research faculty. And um, you know, teaching faculty don't do a lot of research and research faculty generally don't teach. Um, so uh, both of those, uh, both the teaching and research faculties are uh, potentially, um, your your um, host mentors. It just has to um, it just has to be the the right one for the uh, the the particular project that you're you're proposing. And depending on your project, librarians, museum curators, and archivists might also be an appropriate uh, appropriate host. Um, you want to look for an active research program or a teaching profile, and then you want somebody who's going to be hands on and available. Um, in other words, not uh, on uh, on sabbatical or on leave of absence. So somebody who's going to be available while you're on the Fulbright um, experience, uh, who's going to be um, available to actually um, be there. Um, you know, maybe not every day, but certainly on a regular basis to be you know to consult on your project and guide you uh, through um, through the project uh, for the year. Um, and then finally, you want somebody who can, you know, introduce you to other researchers and graduate students, so you can build a network of of grown um, within the country. Okay, so these are some of the things to consider. Now let's look at some search strategies and the resources. And first, um, first of all, in terms of uh, in, in terms of where to get started, um, start with the U of, U of M network. We have a wonderful network here of um, faculty and graduate students um, and researchers um, who are doing a lot of um, different international uh, and comparative research. And um, this is a resource that's available to you and you should definitely take advantage of that. And so use your U of M network Ask them about you know their international research experience. See if they can um, introduce you to some of their international partners. Uh, it's a really good way to get started. So you know, talk to your um, research mentors if you are involved in the research project, like Europe. Talk to your research mentors. 
um, talk to uh, professors and GSIs um, in courses that were, you know, really interested, interesting, and um, you know, related to the topic uh, topic that you're interested in doing with the Fulbright um, professors, GSIs. And then do some research about who's doing research, you know, exciting research on this topic, both on this campus as well as uh, worldwide. And that would be one way to get started. Um, another way to get started would be to, uh, to hook up with the uh, and work with an existing research group. Um, so there are many ongoing research groups, um, not just um, on this campus, but throughout the campus within the um, various campuses within the United States, as well as internationally, that have ongoing research projects, you know, on ongoing um, research groups uh, that are active in working on a project or multiple projects sometimes, and are open to having short-term visitors like Fulbright Fellows. And so, um, and especially for something like Fulbright where you know, you come with your own money and they don't have to fund you to be there. And so it's like having an extra uh, research help uh, without without the research group having to pay for you to be there. Um, and so uh, so many groups are open to having visitors, short term visitors and um, and having you join them for the full right year. Uh, the advantage of doing this and hooking up with an existing research group is really that you're really hook, hooking up with a readily available group of colleagues and mentors. And they already have an active um, research program, and you can just hit the ground running um, and join them and become an active part of it. Um, this is especially important for lab sciences where you need access to things like, you know, bench space and equipment and maybe, you know, wet lab space. Um, though this might also be the case. This might also be the case with, um, with some of the uh, large scale quantitative social sciences as well. Um, the important thing to keep in mind, though, is that if you're going to be hooking up with an existing research group, you still need to carve out your own project for the Fulbright. Um, so you're not going there to be a research assistant, just to be a research assistant to the group, but you still need your own project. And yes, you can be a research assistant part of the time, but you're still going to be running your own project and you need to carve out something um, from that group. Uh, that you can claim as your own um, own project that you're going to be doing during the Fulbright year. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. All right. So some practical considerations um, in terms of um, finding the host affiliation and you know where you might going end up going um, in your Fulbright experience. Um, and this is something to keep in mind that the, your research project location may be limited by the availability of host institution and host mentor. So you might be dying to go to a particular country and uh, and it just may not be that there are research, active research groups or um, some faculty member who can sponsor you to come and uh, do that that particular research um, in this in this country that you you want you want to go. But there are there may be other options in other countries. Um, the other thing you might want to think about is that you may need to alter your research project depending on where you end up and what host institution and host mentors you end up with um, in terms of especially to think about culturally sensitive topics and methodologies and whether um, how to go about doing them and whether it's appropriate even to be doing that kind of research in a particular location. And then again, politically sensitive topics and how to go about um, actually carrying uh, carrying out research projects that are politically sensitive so that you don't run into problems with either the host government or um, uh, the you know parts different parts of the host country all right in terms of resources that are available um, to get you started in addition to um, the uh, you know professors and graduate students and um, those people that you know um, one other place that you might want to um, look into is the area studies centers at the International Institute. These are subunits of the International Institute. We have 17 of them within the II. Uh, the vast majority of them are world region or country specific. And so they're organized by uh, different parts of the world. And so we have the uh, Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, the Center for, uh, for Japanese Studies. Um, so world region and country specific. And then we have um, a handful of those who are, uh, that are uh, global and cross regional in nature and organized by kind of a cross cutting global theme. So we have the Global Islamic Studies uh, Center. 
and we have the Donia Human Rights Center, for example. So these are two examples of the uh, the, the global thematic um, type uh, in the center. Um, each of these units are interdisciplinary community of faculty, students, and staff with interests and experience in the particular world region or the thematic focus of the center. And um, we all, each of these units have a website um, with the people, um, faculty and students and staff that are affiliated with them. Many of the faculty pages that are on these, um, affiliated with these centers, um, contain extensive information about what their um, kind of subject expertise are, as well as their regional or country specific expertise are. And so that's a good place to start. Um, so, uh, here on the bottom of this page is the uh, the website, um, this is a starting point uh, with a list of all 17 of these uh, these units, and um, there are links to um, the individual centers websites uh, from from this page, and you can find out more uh, about them there. Um, in terms of more resources within the university, there are several units that deal with international aspects of, uh, of research um, that are within um, other units, so the medical school has a global reach office. Um, Center for Global Health Equity is a joint, uh, as a collaborative effort between the medical school and the School of Public Health. Um, and um, engineering has the international program in engineering, and there are other schools and colleges also with international and study abroad offices, and those are also good places to start. Um, I also want to mention the U of M Library. The li our library is a great resource. Um, uh, on the online library webpage, there are research guides uh, that are concise, fairly concise summaries and introductions of how to get started um, in a particular field. There is a research guide in international studies. Uh, there are also research guides that are subdivided into specific world regions and countries. So there are um, research guide pages for specific countries of all the specific um, specific world region. Um, there are also subject specialists that are available uh, to consult with you. Um, now each research guide has a subject uh, subject specialist that is responsible for that research guide and that's usually a good person to cite start. Um, there's also a find a specialist um, a link on the on on the library website where you can uh, look for specialists in a particular topic, and so those are definitely ways to get started. Um, and uh, our librarians are a wonderful resource. They they're very knowledgeable, and they do know uh, quite a bit about um, how you know higher education works in um, in a particular country, uh, the country of their specialization, and often have contact uh, at libraries and archives as well as universities. Um, so they, they're also a good place to start. Um, finally, uh, Fulbright resources. Um, these are um, resources that are put together by the Fulbright, the various Fulbright programs. Um, on the, in the US student program, uh, website. You can you'll find links to the um, alumni ambassadors. Um, these are uh, students who have been awarded uh, and the the Fulbright um, award, have done their uh, the Fulbright experience, and have come back and are selected uh, specifically to serve as ambassadors to the Fulbright program and are available to potential applicants um, in terms of answering questions and doing outreach and spreading the word about the Fulbright. So um, each of them has a profile page on the um, on the Fulbright website and, and with an email address where you can contact them and ask them questions. Um, and you can ask them about uh, how did you come up with your, uh, your Fulbright project? How did you find your host affiliation? And they can, um, they can answer those kinds of questions. Um, in a kind of a larger data, uh, the Fulbright program also has a uh, U.S. Student Program Grantee Directory. This is the full list of of all of the Fulbright U.S. Student Award recipients going back to the 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 program's inception in the late 1940s. And you can search this uh, the directory by um, the by the discipline of the um, uh, of the uh, of their project, whether they did an ETA or a, a an open research project, and um, 
uh, and their um, home institution, um, if they if they apply through an institution, which institution they apply through. So you can go and do a search, for example, of all of the U of M uh, recipients and, um, and find out who's gotten them and where they have gone. Um, you will not find direct email addresses in this particular directory, but at least for the U of M recipients, you can come back and search in them community and see if you can contact them and find out a little bit more about what they did and how they go, how they went about, um, about um, you know, locating their um, their host affiliations. Um, finally, I also want to mention the Fulbright Scholar directory. Uh, this uh, this is the um, under the Fulbright Scholar program, and these are the this is the counterpart program the Fulbright program for uh, for people who already have a PhD and are actively were um, in their um, established in their research and teaching career. And in this Fulbright Scholar directory, you will see both the American scholars who have gone overseas, as well as well as international scholars who have come to uh, study and do research in the United States. Um, and the Fulbright alumni are a wonderful network. They're usually very um, helpful with uh, potential Fulbright applicants in terms of connecting. And so uh, in particular, I think of the international scholars who have come to do research in the United States, uh, very often they're willing to pay it forward and sponsor a, a Fulbright student who is interested in coming to their, their own country to do research. So this is another resource that's out there uh, for you to search and see you know, who's doing what and see if you can find somebody who um, is connected to Fulbright uh, who might be able to um, you know, work as a potential, uh, a potential host or at least, you know, um, at least uh, you know, to contact for, um, for, um, for more, uh, more information and uh, potentially a referral to somebody else. All right. To talk a little bit about approaching potential host mentors, uh, because uh, because that is that does take a little bit of thinking. Um, the important thing here that I'm going to say is plan a strategy before you start sending out emails. Um, do plan a strategy. Do some research about the institutions and the researchers beforehand. Know what you're getting into. Um, also, understand the local practice and culture, and find out whether it's is it okay to cold email somebody or do you really need an introduction? And if you need an introduction, what kind? Um, do you really need somebody to, you know, connect you via your email or is it okay just to say, oh, I got your name and contact information from so-and-so? Um, do you need to send the, um, the, the first contact and can you send it in English or does it need to be in a local language? Um, I also meant, I will also mention that particularly for um, contacting a P, uh, people in um, Europe. Um, do be mindful of the summer vacation. Uh, there are definitely uh, in different parts of the world, they take um, their, the concept of summer vacation a lot more seriously than we Americans do. And so there are um, situations where university faculty um, will disappear for their summer vacation for weeks at a time and will not respond to emails. So do pay, atten pay attention to what those practices are and um, and see if you can um, you know figure out when to avoid or when to realize that well I might have sent something but they're not they're not responding because uh, because they're on vacation and um, they don't read emails while they're on summer vacation. Um, do um, keep in mind that it does take multiple iterations to establish a relationship and actually get to a point where you can um, you can get a letter of affiliation. Um, and so this is time consuming, and it does take time. And so uh, you may want to consider pursuing multiple leads um, simultaneously. Now, the flip side of this is that you might be really lucky and actually have multiple leads that work out for you. And then at some point or another, you're gonna have to choose one and make up your mind uh, about uh, what you're going to do. But consider that as a lucky problem to have um, and uh, just to be safe um, so that you don't add, because these things actually do take time to develop, uh, that you might actually want to consider pursuing multiple leads simultaneously rather than sequentially working on one lead. And then if that reaches a dead end, then let's try something else. Um, in terms of the contact, uh, especially for initial contact, uh, keep it relatively short. 
um, you know, include some brief information about how you got the, that person's um, person's information. Give them a brief description of Fulbright, and then a brief, brief introduction of yourself and your research interests, um, and then kind of make a general request about uh, you know opportunities to be a visiting student or researcher, um, and not talk yet about specifics of you know a of the you know research affiliation or affiliate getting an affiliation letter those can come later the initial contact you should keep it relatively short um be um kind of concise about what you're what you're interested in and then if you get a response a positive response especially that they're interested in potentially having you and then you can have a more detailed discussion about the the, the project and and the affiliation letter and those kinds of things now if you get a kind of a um I, I'm not really available kind of a response where so I, I, I can't really do this. You might want um, want to also mention, if you're unable to host, can you introduce me to a, you know to somebody else, a colleague of yours who might be a good host for me? That's That might be another um, thing that you might want to pursue. Now, after you made your follow-up, uh, in your initial contact, you want to make sure that you follow up. And in the follow-up, you can discuss research project specifics, Ask questions, more detailed questions about access and resources like computing, library, lab space, things that you need to do your project, and then discuss your host affiliation letter specifics. Um, now, keep in mind that local institutional protocol may require that uh, the, the host mentor that you're going to be working with may not be the person who's going to sign your affiliation letter. Um, those things you can find out, you know, as you're following up. That does this letter need to be signed by a department chair, or uh, or maybe somebody who's at the dean, um, you know, dean of the faculty level? Um, and those things do vary by country, and so you will need to find out at some point or another, um, you know, exactly what that protocol is. Now, in terms of the actual requirements of the affiliation letter. Um, the full rate requirements are that it, it must be on an institutional letterhead. It must have a signature. Um, and so it can't be just an email. So it, it was actually used to be on a um, on an institutional letterhead and it must have a signature. It can be a PDF document um, or it can be a hard copy letter, which you're going to scan, which, which they're going to send to you and you're going to scan. Um, but the letter comes from the host mentor directly to the student applicant. And then you as an applicant is going to be responsible for uploading that letter to the online application. So as I said, it could be a PDF letter uh, that they prepare and send to you, or it could be a hard copy letter that they actually mail to you. And then you will need to take that and scan that, um, convert that into a PDF, and then upload with your application. Um, as I said, um, the specification for individual awards can come basically two ways. If it says letter required at national deadline, you will need to upload the final letter, um, final uh, letter of affiliation by the national deadline. Um, we will also say that final to the letter is strongly recommended by the U of M campus deadline, but if you don't have it by the campus deadline at the end um, in late August, it's okay. And as long as you get the final letter by the national deadline in October. Um, what you what we do ask is that if you don't have a final affiliation letter by the U of M campus deadline, that you give us some evidence of communication that you've had with your uh, with your potential host mentors and host institution, so that we can see that you're actually working on something and that you actually have um, a, you actually have a potential host um, a host affiliation um, in the works. Um, if it says, if the award description says that the letter is recommend, recommended, as I mentioned before, um, including the letter will enhance your application, but it will not count against you if you don't have a letter. Okay, so this is kind of, uh, we are at the end of the hour. Um, I want to make just a couple of um, real brief um, introduction about um, U of M Fulbright resources. Um, we do have a web page on the IA website. Um, if you go to the um, the II website, ii.umich.edu, and go to the funding tab and find the Fulbright U.S. Student Program, um, you'll find um, our page. And from that page, you can find a link to our Canvas um, resource site. Um, this is a self-joinable si site. If you go to Canvas directly and go to all courses and search for Fulbright, that will also come up. 
Um, we do strongly recommend that you um, you join this Canvas site and one of the um, uh, one of the uh, the resources that you will find on the Canvas site is a collection of um, project uh, the uh, the statements of grant purpose and the personal statements of previously successful applicants. And so you will find those, and many of those that are uh, for independent research will also have letters of affiliation um, along with the statement of grant purpose. So you should go take a look at some of those and see what they what these things look like. And again, um, we have a team of Fulbright advisors here at the International Institute, and we're very happy to uh, talk to you about um, your potential uh, Fulbright application and to, you know where you're going and. Um, and what, what potential projects, and if you have any questions, uh, or if you'd like to talk through your particular uh, project, we're happy to do that. And um, so please uh, make an appointment with us, be happy to talk to you. Uh, we do Fulbright advising throughout the spring and summer, all the way um, up to the, uh, the campus deadline in August. So uh, we'd love to be able to meet you and talk individually about your, um, about your project. All right.